So um, for those of you with, with the Mohican Wildlife Weekend, um, I hope you enjoyed tonight's uh, program and also get a chance to be able to enjoy a lot of the programs that will be going on on Sunday. For those of you who may not know about it, the Mohican Wildlife Weekend is a joint effort between six organizations, including uh, Mohican State Park Resort, where we have programs throughout the um, Ashland County, Richland County, um, all basically conservation, nature-oriented, and almost almost all of them have no fee charge at all. Some of them may have a nominal fee, like the birding boat tours and those types of things. So if you don't have it up top um, at, at the desk, I'm sure they've got some of the information on the schedules of all the cool stuff that's happening tomorrow. Um, the Bird Sanctuary, which is one of the organizations, is a nonprofit organization, which just means that we th um, survive on donations. And so if you come to the sanctuary, it is a free admission facility, but we do appreciate any support you can, you can um, share when you're there. The birds you're going to be meeting tonight, we have Monty the Barn Owl and Ditch the American Kestrel and Ichabod the Turkey Vulture. So you're going to get quite a little variety. Um, besides Monty the Barn Owl, these are all birds that have come through our rehabilitation program. The bird sanctuary, Monty doesn't like to wait. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, they've all come through our rehabilitation program and for some reason or another can, cannot go back out to the wild. If you come visit the bird sanctuary, and I did bring some of the um, programs here, tomorrow because the Mohican Wildlife Weekend we'll be doing a bird show at 1 o'clock. Um, on the hour we do keeper talks, which means all the birds will be out be able to see them up close and photograph them. And there's kids activities tomorrow. I see lots of kids in the room. So we have an obstacle course with prizes, and you get to crawl through tunnels and dig through live worms. So, you know, <laughs> it'll be a good day at the Bird Sanctuary if you want to join us. Um, there's a map on the back. It's really about uh, 40 minutes here from the lodge. And one of the highlights of the Bird Sanctuary, if you haven't been there, is not, not only the 90 acres of um, trails, but we have a songbird aviary. Uh, if you like songbirds, you can walk in there and the cedar wax wings will come and eat right out of your hand. So that's always kind of a joy. So I do, rec I do, uh, I do um, invite you to come to the Ohio Bird Sanctuary. Um, from a little tongue-tied, I've been talking since about 7 o'clock this morning. So I apologize if I digress. If I say something that doesn't make any sense at all, please ask me to repeat it again. Because it probably made sense in my mind, but it might not have made sense by the time it left my lips. We're going to be walking around. You'll get a chance to see the birds up close. They all have anklets on with, with straps, which we'll be holding onto, which means the birds can't fly throughout the room. Um, but that doesn't mean they can't maybe try to jump off the glove and come right back up. You're not allowed to touch the birds, but I do see lots of cameras. Photography is very welcome. The flash will not bother the birds. And as we walk around, you're more than welcome to say, my son, my daughter, or myself as a grandparent or a parent would like to have a picture taken with the bird. Um, and that will be um, able to be done with Monty and Ditch. Don't really recommend it with Ichabod. <laughs> so, um, Ichabod, most of our birds right now, which you'll hear all these vocalizations throughout the program, all three of these birds are very socialized. Two of them are imprints, which means they think they're the human species instead of their own. And so when they look at us as staff members, we're looking really good right now. Um, and especially Ichabod gets very bonded to me during the breeding season, which means everybody in this room, you're all competitors. So he's kind of like a guy puffing up at the bar to protect his girlfriend. So with Ichabod, I'm not as comfortable um, doing photos with him because he might actually see you guys as competition. Um, so, but we'll get a chance to see him up close. We're gonna, I'm gonna start, we're gonna start with Ditch. Um, we're gonna start with Ditch, which is our American Kestrel. As I said, when I walk around, you can look at them up close, but um, I do ask that, that if you've got small children that you just re um, refrain from having them try to reach out and touch them. It just would really startle him. I mean, he's a small guy, and so we all kind of look like uh, big monsters to him sometimes. guy. Doesn't mean he's not amazing. This little guy goes 75 miles per hour. Uh, the American Kestrel is in the falcon family. So just like the peregrine falcon, they're one of the fastest designed birds. The peregrine falcon, which would be their cousin, which would, ray, which would um, be about the size of a crow, can go 280 miles per hour. 
And Falcons are aerodynamic. They're, they're designed for speed. These guys obviously can't go as fast as their cousins, but at 75 miles per hour, still pretty impressive considering the size of this bird. He is a predator, um, so he's going to eat things as small as crickets, cicadas, on up to mice, small snakes, and other birds. Um, this guy could eat, we've actually, he could take like a sparrow, um, actually if he's having a really bold day, even something as large as a morning dove. Unfortunately, one of their favorite birds to eat is probably everybody in this room's also favorite, and that is the hummingbird. So that is a bird that these guys will prey upon. Um, but they catch them with their feet. They are a bird of prey. They have the hook feet. Um, but the American kestrel is one of the few birds of prey that you can tell the males from the females just by looking at them. In most birds of prey, the only way to tell them apart is the female is larger. But in kestrels, there is a difference in coloration. The males often have a solid chest with maybe some black teardrops on it, and their wings are blue, and their tail is kind of this pretty red color, almost the color you might see on a red-tailed hawk. The American kestrel female is, as, as a lot of other bird species, very camouflaged. She's all shades of stripes of brown. The only blue on her body is actually that, that halo on the top of her head. But they both share what we call the lantern stripes or the mustache mark, the black lines underneath the eye. And unlike the hawks that have a, an eyebrow that hangs out over their eye, all falcons have these black marks underneath their eyes that absorb the glare of the sun. So just like a football player or a baseball player or even cheetahs, that absorbs the glare of, their sun, of the sun when they're hunting. Um, on the back of his head, might be a little hard to see from a distance, but when I walk around, you might be able to see it better. He has two dots on the back of his head, and those are the full predators that he's looking the other way. It kind of looks, kind of makes him look like an, an owl looking at you instead of a falcon looking at me. So those false eyes or those black dots are from a distance. A predator would think he's facing this way, so if they were going to try to grab him, they so-called sneak up on him and come around to the back, well, at 75 miles per hour, he's going to be able to get away from anything that's trying to attack him. So that's kind of a type of camouflage for him, even though he's not camouflaged the way the female is. Now, one of the favorite things that the American kestrel can do, especially this guy, is illustrate how many bones he has in his neck. Ah, does anybody know how many bones a bird has in their neck? Anybody know how many a mammal has? How many do we have? Seven, very good. Okay, birds have twice as much. There's our math question for the day. So birds have 14. So any motion we can do with our head, a bird can do twice as far. If we can look at the ceiling, they can flip their head backwards. If we can look to the side, they can look to the back. And if we can turn our head on our shoulder, they can turn their head upside down. In fact, I've had him turn his head around backwards and then flip it backwards. So he had to show off one day for us to show how much he can move his head. But all with those extra vertebrae, that allows him to look in all different directions because notice that he doesn't move his eyes, and you'll see this more when I walk around. They have no muscles around their eyes the way we do. Our muscles connected to the white part of our eyes. So the only way for him to look around is he has to be able to move his head. The other thing about birds is that their vertebrae are fused for flight. So where I can turn my back and my neck and my eyes and look behind me, a bird, he can't move his eyes or his back, so the only way to be able to look behind him is to be able to turn that head all the way around. But with him going 75 miles per hour and those eyes being connected to his skull, if when he's flying and his wings are going like this, if his head's going like this, that means his eyes going like this. And it's going to blur his vision. So what he can do with those extra bones in their neck is like a shock absorber. He can hold his head completely still no matter what his body's doing. So I'm going to move my hand. And I'm going to tell him to keep his head still while I do that. It makes him look like a deer. <laughs> no, I'm going to go to the bathroom. Hold on a second. Multitasking can sometimes be tough. There we go. Ooh, that was a big one, wasn't it? All right, we'll go back to dancing now. See if we can get him to go all the way around. <laughs> so all of that, just because those extra bones. Almost if you think of his neck like a slinky. Uh, now these guys are also cavity nesters. So that means instead, there we go, that's a good one. <laughs> so instead of making a nest, these birds would nest in old woodpecker holes, birdhouses, um, even abandoned buildings. 
sometimes in warehouses. So just like the peregrine falcon that nests on cliff ledges, these guys are going to be let, you know, somewhere where they can kind of nest somewhere flat, but they prefer cavities, which the peregrines usually aren't going for cavities. Um, so you may find that you have, like, um, we've had people where, you know how they used to do the insulation where they drill a hole in the side of the house and blow it in on the old farmhouses? Sometimes when those plugs would come out, then they ended up being perfect for kestrels because all the nice soft insulation in there, and people would often have these falcons living in the side of their house. But not all bad. They eat mice, they eat insects, they're kind of a great neighbor to have around. I'm going to walk around and give you a chance to see Ditch up close. If you guys have any questions, this is kind of a great time to ask as I'm walking around. But as I said, you can get photos or get your picture taken with them. Any other questions? Yes. Um, they have an alarm call that kind of sounds like killy, 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 killy. It's real high pitched. Um, they have a solicitation when they're trying to get a girl's attention that we have hard to imitate and that we hear it a lot lately. Um, it's a little, it's um, kind of like, I can't even do it. I mean, I'm going to butcher it trying to do it. Um, so when out in the wild, you'd be lucky, you'd be most likely to hear that high pitch that sounds like they're saying killy, killy, killy. Uh, but he does have a much softer, more romantic voice when he's trying to get someone's attention.